live. Well, it is a rainy Monday morning, 24th of July, 2023. And I've decided to continue reading out of the autobiography of Joan Grant. Uh, time out of mind, that's her. We're in uh, 1921 in the last chapter. It's the second part of this book. This is chapter two. Planchette. Joan shall be the first woman undergraduate to get a first in the mechanical science tripos, decided father and Mr. Lamb. And I was so eager, eager to make them proud of me that I accepted the assignment, as I would have done if they had wanted me to try to become a trapeze artist or ride a bicycle on a high wire. But I must have a governess who at least knows enough to get me through little go, I reminded them. Through little go. I reminded them, for they were already happily visualising their entry, romping home in the scholastic stakes, because Mr. Lamb, who both set and judged the course, would have trained their filly by coaching it in the evenings, so handicapping all the other starters. I was prepared to put up with a grim, uncongenial blue stocking, probably with steel-rimmed spectacles and a strong moustache. But instead, Miss Griffith came. She was beautiful in a black-haired, Celtic way and so small that she only reached to my shoulder. She bubbled with vitality and I loved her, for she made the dull alloy of textbooks shine like steel. For nearly a month we kept strictly to our roles of governess and pupil. Then one evening I found her running headlong down the passage from the music room, and I knew she was more frightened of the haunt than I was myself. So you feel it too, Griffy, I explained. I'd never presumed to call her anything less formal than Miss Griffith before. She rolled up her right sleeve. I had noticed that she always wore long sleeves, even in the evenings, but thought this was only because she had not expected to be living in an overheated house. A hairy birthmark, as large as black as a bat, and folded her right elbow. I was born in a Welsh village with the blood of the Princess of Cymru in my veins, she said in her lilting musical voice. The midwife told my mother that this mark on me is the sign of a witch. Almost the first thing I can remember is being taught to hide it, even from other children. It is, of course, only superstition, but it is lonely being feared a witch, so I became a mathematician. Oh, darling Griffy, I said, hugging her. We ought to be better witches because we can do trigonometry, and neither of us need be shy about it now there are two of us having to be much cleverer than we want them, when than we want to be. We tried to tackle the haunt in a scientific manner. Griffy, who had read a lot of books on physical research, bought a planchette, a little triangular board with a wheel at two of its angles and a pencil struck through a hole at the third. We took turns at resting our fingers on it very lightly and waiting for it to do automatic writing. For me, it never moved. For her, it wrote with increasing vehemence. At such at first in such large sprawling letters that it rushed off the edge of its full scrap and skidded on the polished table or dug its pencil into the cloth. Then we gave it double sheets of paper draw, drawing paper until it learned to write neatly in three quite different kinds of handwriting. The third of these went down right, from right to left and when it first started we thought it must be from someone who had been Chinese until we found it was only Latin, Latin written upside down. The most interesting of the three writers, and the one who came the most often, was a girl who had been drowned for witchcraft at the end of the 17th century, when she was 23. Looking back, I think it must have been an earlier version of Griffey herself, but oddly enough, this did not occur to either of us at the time. She too had a birthmark which caused people to come to her in search of the old wisdom. She made love potions which worked because no one 
would have dared to consult a witch in those days unless they wanted love enough to make it come true. She very seldom cast spells, and then only grayish ones, such as putting warts on a woman who was cruel to cats. It was after the bit about warts that it occurred to us that if warts could be put on by witches, they could be taken off by the same means. This was relevant, as Iris had four on the sole of her foot, which had been burnt, burnt out and cut out and were still as painful as ever after a year. There was an old woman on Hailing Island. There was an old cowman on Hailing Island. He was over 70 and had never been to the mainland, who was said to have the ward magic. So I persuaded Mother to let him try to cure him, cure Iris. All he did was to rub her foot gently with some green leaves and mutter an incantation under his breath. He refused to accept any money and seemed offended at it being offered. Within three days the warts fell out and she never had any trouble with them again. The efficiency of the wart magic encouraged us to try to dehaunt the music room. Planchette was rather vague about the procedure and was apt to ramble off in Latin, which was tiresome, as some of the words it used were not in our dictionary. We decided to make our attempt on Midsummer Eve, when there was a full moon and parents were away in London. We made a pentacle with white tape secured to the floor by new brass drawing pins. At each point of the pentacle there had to be protective herbs, but as we could not obtain all the ones the Latin writer wanted, we had to make do with the nearest botanical equivalent and use spring onions instead of garlic. The seven silver candlesticks were easy, as I knew my mother kept the key of the silver chest. At first, we could not understand why seven were needed when there are only five points to a pentacle, but Blanchette pointed out rather crossly that the other two were to be held by us within the protection. The candles should have been of pure wax, which Griffey said meant beeswax, as opposed to tallow tips, which being of animal fat, were impure. Making candles from beeswax turned out to be too difficult. It took ages even to make thin ones, and the wicks would not burn properly, so we had to use price self-fixing sixes. We spring cleaned the music room and put a lot of flowers in it. Luckily, we had chosen the day of the local fete, so we let all the maids go to it and told them they could stay as late as they liked at the dance afterwards. We cleaned the candlesticks, first with Goddard's plate powder and then following instructions, I gave them a final polish on the white thighs of a virgin. Then we washed our hair, cut our nails short and had especially long baths, with a lot of scent in the water. The devil hated sweet smell. I gave vodka a bath just to be on the safe side. She hated the music room, so I shut her in my bedroom in case she got worried about me and came scratching at the door to interrupt us at a crucial moment. If I had been more experienced, I should have kept her with me, for dogs are quick to pick up warnings of danger like canaries in submarines. Supper was only green vegetables as we were fasting. Griffey said fasting would be an added protection. By 11.30 I was longing for the maids to come back so we could use the room as an excuse not to get on with it. The moon was shining on the rose garden when we drew the heavy red curtains across the seven windows. Are you sure we couldn't even leave one window, I said, but Griffey was adamant. All the books said ghosts materialize much more easily in a closed room. I was thankful that the right required candles, for it would have been unbearable to have stayed there in the dark. For nearly an hour the candles burned clearly, and I had begun to feel confident that nothing was going to happen. Then, quite suddenly, my heart began to thud, and I could feel cold sweat trickling down my body, shuddering, so I knew she felt it too. In a trembling voice she began to recite the Lord's Prayer. Terror was like a black wall around us, shutting us into a prison. No, worse, into a grave. 
The candles streamed in an icy drought and guttered out. I heard myself scream, Run, Griffy, run! Blindly in the thick darkness we ran, knocking over candlestick, stumbling up the stairs to the gallery, closed, grumbling and hating along the passage, pacing slowly and heavily as far as my bedroom door. An hour after dawn we collected enough courage to go and tidy up the music room. In the cold daylight the pentacle only looked rather silly. When I heard that Sir Oliver Lodge and his wife were coming to stay, Griffy and I were relieved. Although to father he was the famous physicist we had read his, in his book Raymond about how he was often in contact with a son, with his son who had been killed in the war, and we thought he would be able to cure the horn. I hardly liked to mention it to him for several days as he seemed not to notice anything odd in the room, but eventually I did. After making him promise not to say anything to the parents, I told him an expurgated version, as I was afraid that he might think Griffy was an unsuitable governess if he knew she had encountered me to tackle spooks. Do you see anything there? he asked with his kindly smile. I don't often see it, thank goodness, only a few times. He is a monk with cold blue eyes. They seem to glitter in the shadow of his cowl, which is always drawn forward over his forehead. But I often feel him, and do so, so do other people, and hear footsteps. The footsteps are sometimes worse than anything else. I know it sounds silly, having a monk in such a modern house. Not at all, he said consolingly. The uneasy spirit has no knowledge of any building subsequent to his own time. I could quote dozens of examples. He did, and I found it most reassuring for a great scientist to talk so naturally about things which I had learned to keep private, except with Griffy. But you promise not to tell my parents? It worries them when I see things that other people don't see, and life will be much easier when they think I've grown out of it. Certainly I will promise. I think the best thing I can do is to suggest to your mother that she has some seance with a medium I have recently been investigating, a Mrs. Johnstone. She will almost certainly get in touch with your ghost, and once he has been able to tell his story, he will, no doubt, cease troubling you at all. Mrs. Johnson came and stayed for a fortnight, but in spite of all her props, a trumpet, which was put under running water from the bathtub to refresh the control voice, a red shaded night light, hymns on the gramophone, the only manifestation she produced was her own voice, varied by rather clever ventrilogy. There were usually about a dozen sitters, all of them except Griffy and I, who sensed there was nothing less solid than Mrs. Johnston and her trumpet behind the phenomena, and father, whose critical faculty was far too keen to be blunted by mumbo-jumbo, in all sincerity signed papers for forwarding to the Society for Psych 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 Psychical Research, attesting that the medium was genuine, because they had heard her voice and her controlled speaking simultaneously. A year later, after quarrelling with, quarreling with Sir Oliver, Mrs. Johnston boasted to him of the fact that she was a fraud who had been vastly amused at the gullibility of himself and his fellows, fellow investigators. Other mediums, amateur and professional, came to Seacourt in the next few months. Spiritualism was fashionable at the time, and in the most ordinary household, table-turning was an after-dinner game as an alternative to bridge or mayong. But those who were not bogus only had a small talent, which was fast disintegrating under the necessity of trying to keep appointments with the disembodied, as though genuine intuition were as immediately available as a rabbit physically nibbling lettuce in a conjurer's hat. Then Mr. Mead, a stevedore from Portsmouth Dockyard, was brought to us, see to, to sea court, by someone who was only too accurately convinced of his supernormal powers. Poor little man, he became so easily possessed by the uneasy dead that it was painful to see his body jerk and writhe as they used, to to t that they used his tongue to pour forth a stream of Arabic or Hindustani or ancient Greek with a fluency which convinced the most hardened and erudite sceptics. To everyone except Griffy and me, this was proof of the immortality they craved. To us, who could sense the quality of the source, 
it was a demonstration by demons. We prayed desperately to give the power to protect his body and sustain his soul against invaders, but we were not strong enough. All I could do during his last seance, held in full daylight, daylight with 30 people present in the music room, was to leap to my feet and make the sign of the cross, which brought him gasping and twitching out of his trance. I implored him to listen to me, to promise never again to let his body be possessed. The gates are now locked against the demons unless you of your own free will reopen them to the enemy, I declared passionately. I was given a sharp lecture by mother for speaking of subjects of which I knew nothing, and father told me not to make an ass of myself in public. But for three months Mr. Mead did not give any more seances. Then I suppose he could no longer resist the sense of importance they brought into his drab little life or the three guineas he charged for hiring his body to the ungodly, for he wrote to mother saying that he had once again resumed his bookings for trance sitting. The same day he wrote the letter, he went into a trance while walking along a girder in the dockyard. He fell forty feet, not to die, but to linger for years in a hopelessly crippled body, with a mind insane from a skull fracture. After Mr. Mead, the ghost became more tangible, even to stalwart non-believers. The maids would not enter the music room to draw the curtains unless two of them went with the lights full on. A hearty rugger international who cheerfully accepted my five-pound wager that he would not sleep there all night fled from the room at 2 a.m., although a proper bed had been taken there for him so he could not pretend he got cramp sleeping on the sofa. A visiting coleoperist hastily left after what he swore must have been a ton weight crashed to the floor within three feet of him, and nothing fell. Although I heard it, he muttered to me with a trembling hand. He packed his precious beetles into a specimen case and left. Griffy was so afraid that the, she only dared to sleep with a large ebony cross clasped to her chest. We burned Blanchette and everything it had written in the schoolroom fire, and I decided to try to become a safe, competent, scientific materialist. Right, this was chapter two of part two of Out of Mind. Happy Monday, guys. <laughs>